Welcome to our world news program. Today, we've got some intriguing stories lined up for you. First up, luxury brands like LVMH and Prada are seeing a sales boom in Japan, sparking hopes for a similar resurgence in China's overseas shopping, though the reality is more complex. Next, a troubling incident in Virginia where a group of white students allegedly told an Asian-American fifth grader to sit at a segregated table has prompted the school to take action and incorporate lessons on respect and inclusion. Finally, HSBC is making waves by targeting lending against fast-growing private assets after acquiring the UK unit of Silicon Valley Bank, aiming to capitalize on the booming private markets. Please stay tuned for the detailed coverage of these stories. Reuters Breaking Views reports that Japan is experiencing a luxury boom, with companies like LVMH, Prada, and Richemont seeing significant sales growth. Prada CEO, Andrea Guerra, noted that sales in Japan grew nearly 50% in the first quarter of 2023 compared to the previous year. Similarly, LVMH reported strong double-digit growth, and Richemont saw a 20% increase in annual revenue. This surge in luxury spending is partly attributed to Japan's late reopening post-COVID-19, making year-on-year comparisons particularly flattering. However, the weak yen, which has fallen to a record low against the dollar, is also a significant factor. Despite these positive trends, the broader picture remains nuanced. Chinese tourists, who were once major spenders on luxury goods abroad, have not returned to their pre-pandemic habits. In 2019, Japan welcomed nearly 10 million visitors from China, but in 2024, fewer than 900,000 have visited so far. Additionally, Chinese tourists are now spending less on shopping and more on experiences, with domestic travel surpassing pre-COVID levels. This shift suggests that while Japan's luxury market is thriving, a full recovery in Chinese tourist spending may take longer. Yahoo US highlights a troubling incident at Lyle's Crouch Traditional Academy in Alexandria, where a group of white students allegedly told a fifth-grade boy of mixed Asian descent that he couldn't sit with them. The boy's mother, Catherine Kelly, reported that the students segregated themselves by race, with African-American and black students being told to sit even further away. The incident occurred during an after-school game and left the boy confused and distressed. The school's principal acknowledged the inappropriate nature of the game in a letter to parents, attributing it to a misguided role-play of a social studies lesson. Kelly believes that while it's essential for children to learn about segregation and white supremacy, it should be done in a way that underscores the seriousness of these issues. Greg Carr, an Afro-American studies professor at Howard University, suggests that lessons on inclusion can be made more effective by incorporating personal stories from elders who lived through segregation. The school plans to introduce lessons on thinking before speaking and acting, aiming to ensure all students feel valued and respected. South China Morning Post reports that HSBC is capitalizing on the growing market for private assets by offering lending services against these often illiquid investments. Following its acquisition of Silicon Valley Bank's UK unit, now rebranded as HSBC Innovation Banking, the bank sees significant opportunities in this sector. Jerky Rahio, head of credit advisory for Asia Pacific at HSBC Global Private Banking, noted that the rise of private markets presents both challenges and opportunities for wealth managers and private banks. Traditionally, private banks have focused on public markets, but the increasing investment in private assets by wealthy individuals necessitates new financing solutions. HSBC's strong balance sheet and expertise in private funds allow it to lend against a wide range of alternative assets, including venture capital and private equity. The bank also offers GP financing for private fund managers to help them meet their financial commitments. With private equity assets under management growing 22% annually over the past five years, HSBC aims to leverage its position in key markets like Hong Kong, which has become a major hub for private assets in Asia. South China Morning Post China is once again a magnet for Southeast Asian tourists, thanks to the introduction of new visa-free entry programs and simplified access to the country's cashless payment systems. According to Kluke Travel Technology Limited, bookings from Southeast Asia to mainland China in 2024 have surged to levels several times higher than before the pandemic. Ethan Lin, Kluke's CEO, shared these insights during the UBS Asian Investment Conference in Hong Kong, predicting that inbound travel to China could return to pre-COVID numbers by 2025. The easing of visa restrictions for travelers from Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, and selected European countries, along with cruise ship passengers, has played a significant role in this resurgence. Additionally, China has been working to make its cashless payment systems more accessible to foreign visitors and has warned hotels against turning away overseas customers. In 2022, China reported 82 million tourist arrivals, 
reaching about 56% of the 2019 level, with visits from outside Hong Kong and Macau lagging by 57%. CNN. In a significant development for Australia-China relations, China has lifted bans on imports from five major Australian beef processing facilities. This move is part of a broader trend of improving ties between the two countries. The bans, imposed between 2020 and 2022, were part of a wider range of restrictions on Australian commodities such as coal, timber, and wine, following Australia's call for an independent investigation into the origins of COVID-19. Despite these bans, Australian beef continued to flow to China from other facilities. Matt Dalgleish, an analyst at Episode 3, noted that the removal of these restrictions is expected to boost Australian beef shipments to China, especially as the US, Australia's main competitor, faces a shrinking cattle herd. Last year, China was Australia's second-largest beef export market, receiving 240,000 tons worth approximately $1.6 billion. While most trade barriers have been lifted since a change in the Australian government two years ago, some restrictions, like those on Australian lobsters, remain. Australian officials continue to press for the removal of all trade impediments. al -Khathera. China has lifted an import ban on five Australian beef producers, marking another step towards mending the strained relations between Beijing and Canberra. Australian Foreign Minister Penny Wong welcomed the decision, attributing the progress to the calm and consistent approach of the Albanese Labour government. The bans, initially imposed in 2020, were seen as a response to Australia's call for an international investigation into the origins of COVID-19. While China cited trade-related issues like labelling and contamination, many in Australia viewed the restrictions as politically motivated. Since Anthony Albanese became Prime Minister in 2022, many of these trade barriers have been lifted. Last year, China was Australia's second-largest international market for beef, importing about $1.6 billion worth. Wang highlighted that the suspensions have now been lifted for eight beef processing facilities, although two remain suspended. She emphasized that removing all trade impediments benefits both nations, noting that the value of impeded Australian exports has significantly decreased from $20.6 billion to less than $1 billion. The recent lifting of tariffs on Australian wine and restrictions on coal, timber, and barley imports are further signs of thawing relations, though Australian rock lobsters remain under an unofficial trade ban. Thank you for tuning in. The content above showcases the latest briefing reports and analytical synopses, thoughtfully curated by the 6 Do team. These insights stem from a wide array of reputable media outlets, think tanks, government sources, and specialized experts worldwide. We encourage you to explore these sources for a comprehensive perspective. Keep in mind that while the content may not always align with the official standpoint of 6 Do brief, it's not meant to be taken as absolute directives for decision-making. Comprising seasoned media professionals, learned scholars, and accomplished scientists, the 6 Do team embodies a trailblazing, fully independent media entity. To customize 6 Do Brief to meet your professional needs, you have the option to subscribe to a diverse array of briefings on our website, 6dobrief.com. Regardless of your location, you can conveniently receive 6 Do Brief via email.